just about three to four minutes ago, y'all have no idea how thankful I am that we have a sound team up there. Because my worst fear was just realized about three to four minutes ago for the first time in pastoring for almost 13 years. I, a lot of times, if you notice, when I go out of here during the offertory, unfortunately, uh, I guess I've got a small bladder, but I often have to run to the restroom. But when I stepped out of the restroom just a moment ago, my greatest fear was realized as I looked down and the green light on my microphone was on. <laughs> so I am very thankful there are men up there that have to push a button for you still to be able to hear what comes through my microphone until it's time for you to hear what comes through my microphone. <laughs> You're welcome, Neil. I'm actually glad I didn't get to share this morning. There was a book that was written a few years back called The Day America Told the Truth. And in this book, 91% of the people that live in this nation admitted to, or we could say confessed to, lying regularly. 91%. 86% of Americans routinely lie to their parents. 75% admit lying to their friends. 73% admit lying to their siblings. And 75% admit lying to their spouse. Now, none of this is news to anybody. We live in a society where just about everyone considers it normal to lie. Yeah, you know, it's just a little white lie. Before coming to Christ, most people actually embrace lying, and they think it's a, a necessary skill of life in today's world. And I think everyone knows this. We all know that just about everyone lies. So unfortunately, because of it, our nation has developed now this healthy sense of skepticism. No one accepts anything at face value. We're told if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And when promises are made to us, we're told not to get our hopes up because chances are most likely we're going to be disappointed. On the screen, you'll see a picture of a statue. If you've ever been on the campus of Harvard University, this is one of the main focal points of the whole campus. If you've never been or if you ever get the chance to go, this is usually one of the main things that anybody that goes to that campus, other than those that are going as students, naturally, want to go and see. The statue of John Harvard. And tradition says that if you walk up, and I think it's his left front big toe, if you'll rub it, it'll bring you good luck. And uh, I'm sure if you ever get the thrill of going, after you get over the thrill of saying, you can't park your car in the Harvard Yard about 30 billion times, and you make it to the statue, and you get a chance, I wouldn't recommend rubbing the toe. I don't believe in luck. But what many people don't know is it's really a statue of three lies. That's what this is. That's what you're seeing. There's an inscription beneath the statue that reads, John Harvard. Founder, 1638. Not a word of it's true. Despite what the plaque on the statue says, Harvard didn't actually found Harvard. The college, it was actually a college back then, was founded in 1636, not in 1638, by the Massachusetts Bay Colony in what was then the village of Newtown and later became Cambridge. John Harvard was basically a benefactor for the college. And it was named after him in 1639 after he do donated his library to the school. Even worse, that's not even John Harvard sitting there. There were no pictures or images of him. So in 1844, the sculpture, a band by the name of Daniel Chester French, randomly chose a student at the school, had him dress up in 17th century garb, and pose for the statue. French did give the statue skinny legs. That was one symptom of tuberculosis, which John Harvard had. So in spite of what this inscription claims, John Harvard was not the founder of Harvard. The university was not founded in 1638. And the statue's likeness is not even of its namesake. And all this is in front of Harvard University's hall, where the motto, ironically, is Veritas, 
which means truth. Things are not always as they seem. Last week, we began a study in this series of the ninth chapter of the book of John about a man that was born blind. And in the book of John, it only records seven of Jesus' miracles. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting into this this morning, but there are seven miracles that are recorded in the book of John, and each one of them are to show basically to the world, to the people back then, especially to the Jewish nation, the deity of Christ. And if you look at those seven miracles that he performed, it basically demonstrates that he has power and authority over everything in our lives, over everything in existence. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the miracles, but the first one is the uh, wedding in Canaan when he turns water into wine. He has the power to transform one substance into another. And when you're talking about water into wine, you're not talking about a substance, you're talking about time. He actually has to be in control of time because the only way you can get wine is by time. So when he went and made this miracle in Cana, it was much more than just changing a substance of water into a substance of wine. You've got a whole time factor involved in this. You can't just take grapes and squeeze them in a bottle and have wine. You've got to age the juice for it to become wine. And he goes right on through with the miracles. But this is the seventh. Seven being the number of completion, seven being the number of perfection, and it's also where it's showing us that he and he alone, as we looked at in part last week, the one who creates the eye is the only one who has the power to open our eyes. Now, this man was born blind, and we see that Jesus, last week we saw, comes along and heals him. He spits in the mud. He makes a little bit of clay. He wipes it on the guy's eyes. He tells him to go to Siloam and wash. The guy does. And the Bible says he came back seeing. But I brought out the point then, and I want to reiterate this morning. That was not his salvation. He met Jesus. He was touched by Jesus. He was healed by Jesus. The Bible says Jesus actually anointed his eyes. But he did not experience salvation at that point. That's going to happen but it hasn't happened as of yet. But the reason that Jesus did this miracle was not only to show his deity and that he has power over every part of life, but it's also to demonstrate to us today, as just as I stated last week, just as this man was born blind physically, each one of us are born blind spiritually. And just as he is the only one that has the power to open eyes physically, he also is the only one that has the power to open our eyes spiritually. And so that was part of last week's, for those who may not have been here. Today we're going to continue on in this story because now that Jesus has performed this miraculous sign, the people are so overwhelmed and so excited, and some of them even divided, they got to bring him to the church. They got to bring him to the preacher and to the deacons and all and, and just see what they've got to say about all this stuff. And amazingly, we're going to see that the preacher and the deacons and all the staff leaders of that time, that's kind of who those guys represented, the priest, they couldn't see as good as the man who had been blind. They couldn't see as well as a man who hadn't even had his sight probably an hour yet by the time he was drugged in front of these church leaders. So let's begin. Take your Bible and stand with me this morning. This is my Bible, the light unto my path. I believe it is the indestructible, inexhaustible, infallible Word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. My mind is alert. My ears are open. And my heart is receptive to receive God's Word. Today I will be forever changed. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. That tongue problem Tony and them were having, they must have left some of it up here. Chapter 9, let's begin in verse 13. 
they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. You know, one of the things that I thought about as I've pondered and meditated on these verses and prayed through them all week, though, is I can't help but wonder, and it's not really part of the message this morning, but notice it says they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. I wonder how many of these same people that were so quick to drag him to the church now walk by this man every day of their lives and never even gave him the time of day. Never even had a moment to help him, give him anything, and now all of a sudden they're ready to take him somewhere. Before when he actually needed them to lead him or take him somewhere because he couldn't see, I wonder how much time they had for him. But anyway, they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, What do you say about him? Since he opened your eyes... And he said, he is a prophet. Father, as we look into your word today, Lord, and continue this study, we looked last week at who you are, your power, your deity, that you are the one true God who is not only the creator of life, but who has power and authority over every part of life and every part of this universe and creation. But Father, we pray today especially, Lord, as we continue to look and especially at those who, in a sense, were the church and the leaders, we see, Lord, that they weren't able to. We see that this man, even as blind, was able to see so much more than they. And we can't help but wonder, Lord, what caused this blindness for them not to be able to see and to recognize who you are. Father, help us, we pray. If there is a spiritual darkness or blindness in our own hearts and minds and lives, that it would be removed this day and that the light of the world would shine in, that we would see the truth of who you are and who we are and where we are in relation to you. We praise you, we love you, we ask you these and all things in Christ's name. Amen. The first thing I believe that were blocking these men's vision was this. They couldn't see because of tradition they couldn't see because of tradition notice it states in there that it was a sabbath when jesus did this you know it doesn't take much for something to become a tradition in church sometimes if you do an event or something more than one or two times all of a sudden it's become a tradition all of a sudden even the congregation begins sometimes to say well hey when are we going to do that again when are we going to do it the next time it's so easy if we're not careful for things that we start or even things that God may call us to, to become a tradition. And once it's a tradition, it's hard to stop. It's sometimes hard to end. And sometimes because of it, it's also hard to see. The Pharisees couldn't see how Jesus could be of God because he had chose to heal this man on the Sabbath. And you just didn't do anything like that on the Sabbath. You just, didn't, you just didn't do anything like that. Now keep in mind, the Sabbath was a holy day set apart by God. So this was more than just a tradition. But they had become so conditioned in their tradition of worship that it was more of a bunch of rules and regulations than what it was God had ever instituted. They'd become so routine in their worship that when God actually showed up in their midst and did a miracle, they weren't amazed and in awe. They weren't amazed at all. Matter of fact, they were kind of upset about it. You know, many churches that have gone to two services always seem to have the same battle. The older folks, a lot of times, want to have a more traditional service with hymns and the songs that were sang a year ago, and the newer, younger generations want the contemporary worship and all that. And so what a lot of churches has done because of that is they went to two services. But what I was always amazed when I would hear about some of my pastor associates and friends that were going through these battles was um, 
most of the time the older generation that wanted the traditional music, even though most of the time older generations are people that their children are grown, gone, all that stuff, and they're usually very early risers. But yet they didn't want to do the early service. They wanted the traditional service done at the traditional time of 11 o'clock. You know why? Because they didn't believe God was going to show up at no 930. God shows up at 11. And that's the point I'm trying to make about where these guys, not that the Sabbath day wasn't holy, but we can get into such a rut, so to speak, even just like now, our Lord's day is Sunday. But I can promise you, if you'll show up to worship, he'll meet you here at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. You want to stay on in here to about 3 o'clock today, he'll stay right here with us. I see y'all heads. Hold now, preacher. Hold now. Don't, don't get carried away. But that's the problem. These guys were upset. They weren't able to look past this tradition and to be able to see that even though God had commanded this day to be holy, he also is a God who said, listen, I am always at work, and I can choose to work when and on whatever days I want to. I set the Sabbath aside for your rest, not for mine. I don't need it. I'm at work all the time. Jesus told them that repeatedly. My Father is always at work, and I too am working. And if it just happens to be the Sabbath, well, let's see. I think this is my day, so I can do what I want to. You know, we talk about things not being the way they appear, and here are the men, basically, like I said, these are the, the pastors the staff ministers, the deacons, if you will. And they're the, supposed to be the ones that are in mo the most in tune with God. And yet here he is working a miracle all around them, and they're not even able to see it's him. Why? They were blinded by tradition. Things are just not always the way they appear. As a matter of fact, I would say, we're living in a time right now, it's almost as if hardly anything we see with our eyes today is really what it appears. Now, I'm not going to preach a lot of doom and gloom to you this morning, but I'm telling you right now from our economic status to what's happening in this nation, governmental and every things are not what they'd appear. Right now, it appears kind of like since 2008 and that big crash and the big recession that everything's kind of got back to normal. No, we're not back up here where we were, but at least it's kind of... But I can promise you this morning, things are not as they appear. They're not as they appear. I found this out the other hard way, too, just a couple of weeks ago. This is the first time this has happened to me, and I'm sure it won't be the last it just almost took my appetite away. And the bad part about that was the fact that I was actually ordering my lunch. But I went over to Smithfields and Hope Mills to have lunch. And I stepped up to the restaurant and placed my order, the uh, barbecue sandwich combo thing and all. And the guy rang me up and he was like, um, that's be $7.12. And he, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. After your senior discount, sir, yours are... I said, what would you say? He said, it was your senior discount. And the first thing that popped into my mind is, wait a second. I actually just washed the gray out of my hair last week. And you're telling And then I realized it was about 75 cents he was talking about saving. I was like, okay, well. I'm <laughs> they couldn't see because of tradition. Look at verses 18 through 28. The Jews then did not believe it of him that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them saying is this your son who you say was born blind then how does he now see his parents answered them and said we know that this is our son and that he was born blind but how he now sees we do not know or who opened his eyes we do not know ask him he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. 
For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He then answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? They reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. The first thing that blinded these guys was the tradition. They weren't able to see who they were talking to, dealing with, was in their very midst, was because of tradition. The second reason they were not able to see was because of testimony. Wait a second, preacher. Most of the time, people like to hear testimonies. Well, it depends on who it's coming from, especially when you're the leader. When they looked at this guy, all they saw was a blind beggar, a nobody. He didn't have any social standing. He didn't have any status. Nobody even knew who he was. They were very skeptical as to whether they were going to believe him or not. And now he's telling some kind of story that they can't even see a way possible that even God would have done it because it happened to be on the seventh Sabbath. So they couldn't see because of the testimony. Now, we need to understand, we are either a child of the kingdom of light, according to God's word, or a child of the kingdom of darkness. That's what the Bible says. Every single person alive on this earth and sitting in this sanctuary today you are either a child of the light or a child of the dark. If you truly know Jesus Christ and accepted him into your life, you are a child of the light. If that hasn't happened, the Bible says you are a child of the dark. A child of the king of light. You have the light of life inside of you. But you've also got a promise that there is a greater light to come. That what we're experiencing now is just a touch, just a taste of heaven but there is so much more to come that we is so grand so unbelievable that our minds can't even conceive it so we don't even understand it all but on the flip side of that if you're not a child of the light you are a child of the king of darkness there is no light within there is no greater light to come there's actually greater darkness Hell is described as a place of darkness or blackness. And the only way I can imagine the total isolation brought on by such complete darkness is the blackness that you experience if you've ever been deep inside of a cave or a cavern. I don't know about you, but I've been in quite a few of the caverns that you can tour around our nation when you go into some of the uh, cave systems up in the Shenandoah Valley and at other places in Linville. But almost every one of those tours that I've ever been on always do one thing that is kind of in like or in common with the other. At some point in the tour, usually when you're in the deepest part of that cavern, they'll bring all the visitors to kind of a, a safe place of rest, and then they turn out all the lights. Now, it's been quite a few years since I've been and matter of fact, the last time I was in one, I'm not even sure if we had these things. I don't know how that works anymore with everybody having cell phones and lights now when they try to get it dark in a cavern. Probably half the people in there are turning their phones on. But if you've ever been in one of those caves and experienced that, there is no darker darkness that I've ever experienced. It's so dark and so black, you could actually stick your finger in your eye and never see it coming. It is the complete and total absence of light. This is about as complete a darkness as a man can know. But the Bible says this darkness is actually going to be multiplied many times over for those who spend an eternity in hell. I don't know how dark that's going to be, but I can tell you even as a believer and even in that cave and knowing we were safe and knowing there was a guide and knowing somewhere there's a switch to turn the lights back on, when you've experienced that before, that darkness, that solitude, 
that silence, it's a very eerie and unsettling feeling. And now imagine for all eternity, blackness. You can't see nothing. The God also taught us an interesting fact. They said that a person who were to go down into a cavern in that deep a recess, if they were to remain down there for just approximately six months or so, in that complete and total darkness without absolute no light, they would become irrevocably blind. That the darkness not only hinders sight, it actually causes blindness. Now, when you accept Christ, you receive the light of the world inside you. You are, if you are living a spirit-filled life, he will illuminate the truths to your heart so that when you hear them, you recognize them as truth, and in turn, you believe them. But on the other hand, if you haven't received Christ, the light of the world is not within you. And therefore, the Bible says you're walking in darkness. And remember what happens if you remain in total darkness for a long enough period of time? You become blind. You become blind. So much so that even when the light is shining on you, as it was with Jesus, the light of the world was standing before these men with his light basically shining upon them. And they still weren't able to see. The Pharisees had become blind. But notice much of it is by willful choice. They, wouldn't, they refused to see because of tradition. They refused to see because of the testimony and most likely because whose testimony it was. They rejected him. He didn't line up with their traditions. Now they're rejecting the testimony because they believe this beggar isn't worthy of God's attention. God don't pay attention to the scum of the earth. He looks at the, the holy people, the religious people. And this guy sure ain't somebody to be speaking on his behalf. Now look at verses 29 through 34. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Well, here is an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and are you teaching us? So they put him out. They couldn't see because of tradition. They couldn't see because of the testimony. And they couldn't see because of the teaching. And you know, here's the amazing part of this story. These men had spent their life teaching other people, the church, the congregation, our Savior is coming. Our Savior is coming. The long-awaited Messiah is going to come. He's going to come and redeem us. He's going to come and make things right. He, they had been teaching it year after year for generation after generation. And now he has come. And they couldn't see him. They couldn't see him. They couldn't believe this man back to the beggar. They couldn't believe that this man had anything to teach them. They were the teachers. They knew it all, had done it all, or had talked to somebody who had. How dare this man actually think he may be able to teach them something? Didn't he, didn't he know who they were? I wonder this morning, do you have a teachable spirit? Do you have a teachable spirit? Do you realize right now that God could save somebody in here this morning? Okay, and them just coming to Christ. And you could have a conversation with them this afternoon, and God could speak a profound truth through them, something deeper than you've ever heard. But if you think, wait a second, I've been saved 20 years, they just got saved this morning, they can't teach me nothing. That's where these Pharisees were. 
When we're talking about the power and the Spirit of God, it has nothing to do with who you are, your education, your intelligence, your knowledge. All that stuff becomes null and void. It is about the power of God's Spirit in you, speaking through you. And in that instance, it doesn't matter if you've been saved one day or 10,000 days. Because it's all God doing it. Do you have a teachable spirit? Or have you pretty much learned it all? You've been doing this church thing.